Aldis podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Aaron Quitkin. Aaron is the founder and CEO at Profit AI. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Aaron, let's start with a little bit of background of yourself. And I know your path to being a founder and CEO of an AI company is a little bit unique. So can you give us two or three minutes on what's led you to where you are today? So I've been in the PR and communications business for a little bit more than three decades, which is a long time. And uh, my background is primarily in really crisis communications, issues management, as well as ESG and social impact, and just managing corporate reputations for organizations, not for people. And back when I started in this business, on the agency side, and the professional services side in particular, I started in Washington, D.C. in the early 90s. And there were two questions then that we always tried to answer for clients. And those two questions are still unanswered today. And they are this. In the PR world, uh, again, I'm not a data guy, so I'm more on the words side of things, but I have extraordinary respect for technology and data and insights. But the two questions were basically, and it's going to sound a little reductive, but just hang with me here on this. One, will a reporter know? How will I know if a reporter is interested in my pitch, my story idea? So what a lot of people don't know is that oftentimes what reporters cover and write across multiple platforms whether, whether it's print or broadcast or what have you, is pitched to them by PR people who are representing brands. And we're constantly pitching in the dark. We don't really know if that reporter is going to be interested. So that's one question. The second question is, if that reporter does write or cover my story or my idea, how do I know it's actually impacting my business? And that's like the measurement side, right? Fast forward 30 years plus today, we still don't have answers to those. There's a lot of very smart people working on KPIs. How do I know that my PR is working? And there are both some kind of anecdotal as well as far less subjective ways to measure that. But what we still don't know today is whether or not a reporter is going to be interested in my pitch. And that led me to build profit using technology to predetermine a reporter's interest in your pitch. And then if they do write, what type of sentiment will they write with, positive, negative, or neutral? And to date, that has been very manual, very manual. And it takes hours and hours of research, and you'll still potentially get it wrong and waste a lot yeah. of time. Which is a great segue into you've been on the, I suppose, the, what we would refer to as the product side or the customer side, and you saw this need and nothing being done about it. So how, talk to us about the transition from identifying, look, this is a problem that needs to be solved. How did you go from that to founding Profit as a, an AI-driven SaaS platform? What's that journey been like? And talk to us about Profit's mission and to tackle this problem. I spent the latter part of my career in the last 16, 17 years building my own agency. And about two years ago, I was fortunate enough to have a partner in the company in the name of Stagwell and somebody named Mark Penn, who was the former political strategist for Bill Clinton. He was in that White House for eight years. He ran Hillary's first campaign in 2008. He's a pollster. He's a numbers guy. He's a data guy. And uh, two things happened that were quite fortuitous. So I sold my agency to this company called Stagwell back in 2010. I stayed on, continued to scale it, and that was my first kind of taste of entrepreneurialism. And I'm also very interested and devoted to the tradecraft. I love what what I do for a living. What had always frustrated me, and this is quite fortuitous, when Mark Penn joined Stagwell in 2019, what had always frustrated me is that our business has been very analog. And the only technology that we really use, I'm not kidding when I say this is so sad, is email, uh, Slack. Comms tech, as it's called, or MarTech, has not really hit the PR industry in a way that it should. So I approached Mark with this idea, and he held this like internal Shark Tank type competition where he said, you know, I'm going to provide funding for the best idea that sits in the intersection of marketing and technology. And like you said, I come at this from the customer side. What would I want? What is it that I'm frustrated? What are some of my unmet needs? And we beat out all these other agencies. We funded this thing. 
And it's probably been the most humbling experience of my life because I'm not a tech. And anytime I log into any application now, be it personal or professional, I have enormous respect for the amount of time, user stories, enhancements, uh, sprints and scrums, all those things that all your folks like to talk about on this podcast, everything that's gone into that. So I wrote the logic inside of spreadsheets. And then we partnered with uh, the technology division of Stagwell to actually write the code. And it took us about a year to build it. We've been in the market for a year. We have about a dozen customers. We're doing well. We're constantly enhancing it. It's an enterprise product. I guess DAS is the new one instead of SaaS. So it's data as a service. It's all web, very secure. And, and then we just recently announced the pay-as-you-go model. So one of the things that we've been learning about our industry is that like any business, it takes a long time to convince procurement and a CFO, especially in large publicly traded companies, to sign on to your service. You got to go through InfoSec and all sorts of things. Great. There's a lot of kind of rogue and high-spirited individuals that work in my business, in my industry. And we decided not only will we offer them a credit card option, but what if we offer them a pay-as-you-go option? First month at a certain price point, and after that, it drops by 20%. And you can cancel within 30 days and we take Venmo. So what we're trying to do is create a more modern technology driven approach to finding the right reporter using AI techniques, primarily NLP and ML, so that we're removing all of the gap out of our business. Do I think this reporter is going to be interested in my pitch or do I know with greater certainty? We literally assign percentages of interest that reporter would have in your pitch and it frees up time. And the other big issue in our business is just managing executive expectations. Every brand, I'm sure you've run into this too, everybody thinks they're more interesting than they really are. So say, hey, PR person, whether you're in-house at a brand or at an agency, I have this great idea. We just launched a new website. It's, Who cares? Nobody cares. Or we're just donating. We decided to donate a million bars of soap to some organization. And it's very hard for PR people to date to just say to that executive who thinks they're more interesting than they are, that's not that interesting. But now we have data to say, no one's going to be interested in that story. But when we rerun it and test it using this platform, here's how we can change the narrative of this, of this story to make it stickier, to make it more interesting, more resonant with the audience. It's a very important point to, to showcase why the data behind these recommendations are so valuable and it's been missing in your industry for so long. I want to stay on, on the topic of behind the scenes on the tech side. I know you've already prefaced that you're not the tech person, but obviously it's your company founder and CEO. So can you give us some insight into what it's like behind the scenes? What's the current makeup of the tech team? And, you know, walk us through at, at a high level how AI allows you to, to give these data and insights to your users. Yeah. So at, at its core, without disclosing too much, we're looking at, it's based on the assumption that if a reporter has written about something in the past, a topic or an adjacent topic, we're assigning a likelihood and, and the timing of it and when they write, they're assigning a likelihood against what whether or not they will write about that topic again in the future. That's the core of it. So it's a lot of matching type technology. And we have prim we have what we would probably consider pretty traditional engineering and tech setup. So we've got backend, front end developers, DevOps, QA, UX, UI, and data science. And the part that probably is the hardest, and maybe for me, is the data science part. We're constantly looking at what's working, where is it not working, and doing new enhancements every two weeks on a very large data set. I think some of the learnings for me is one, you can't just say to a dev, hey, isn't that just like a simple little button you can throw up on the dashboard? There's no such thing. And I get very impatient. These things take so much longer than they than I think they should. But in order to do them right, you have to have patience and you have to constantly test. And the other thing I think has been quite interesting and a little very humbling for me is the quality of the data and making sure you don't just have single source of like anything. And it sounds so cliche, you're only as good as your data. And where we've had to make probably more investments than I had ever expected is in making sure the integrity of our data is as sound and as performative as possible. But to say that it's been a humbling but very rewarding journey is probably an understatement. Somebody who is not a tech person at all. I, I am the customer. 
Well, it's great to hear from that perspective because many of the, as you said, many of the people listening will be pure tech people and they've probably ran into this type of conversation in the past where they're working with senior leadership or front office who, who maybe don't have a full appreciation of the complexity of what goes on behind the scenes. So to hear you speak so candidly about it, I'm sure is refreshing and also helpful for the people currently working there at Profit. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team, or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. Staying on the topic then of the team, because you obviously you launched the business a few years ago now, and it's been growing. Can you give us some insight into where you're at now from where you started, what the growth has been like. And part two of that question is when you look ahead for 2022 and beyond, where do you see the business growing to, whether it's on, on new customer segments or just individual hiring? I'm probably more excited about part two, but I'll, I'll touch on part one. The part one is I think I needed to manage my own expectations around how quickly you can sell to an enterprise. So my background is professional services and it's very RFP driven. The decisions are made in the span of anywhere from two days to two weeks to three months. And as you know, and your listeners know, SaaS sales on average might be closer to six months plus. It's rare that it's, it's quicker. And what we've found is making sure that, or what we've learned is that having an ally or an advocate inside of the prospect organization, prospective organization is critical. Making sure that you get to know as fast as you get to yes is very critical um, because I just don't want to waste my time in a prospect that's never going to buy, but they're too nice sometimes to say no. So you just have to move on. At the same time, I've also learned in the same way that I have in my professional services world to really listen to the customer and the prospect. And we've been pivoting very quickly, changing things, adding features, things like podcasts, funny enough, things like potentially in the future newsletters and Substacks and things like that, understanding where the market is going and not trying to sell something uh, to somebody that they don't necessarily need. So that's chapter one. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, launching a pay as you go model, an individual subscription and making the platform more accessible to people, not just organizations, is something we literally did just a few days ago. And I do think it's an interesting stalking horse strategy as it relates to selling to enterprise. So that's kind of part one. Part two is even more exciting because I envision a world where we can teach a platform like Profit a voice skill. So you could say, hey, Alexa, and now I forgot to turn my Alexa off, so she's listening to me. I have an idea, um, a story idea. Can you check Profit for me? And everything will be connected, right? Um, because that is the way active brainstorms around narrative and pitching narrative to journalists in the PR world. That's how it happens. And we always go on our gut and our instinct. We need to backstop it with data to be more performative. So I think that's going to be really interesting. I also think that increasing our data set to include more alternative forms of media, even communities like Reddit, as well as, like I mentioned before, Substacks, we added podcasts. It's not just linear, traditional analog media anymore that we're pitching. There's so many different ways to inf- and create more narrative in the marketplace. So I do envision a future where there will also be an opportunity for, and this is very controversial in my business, using predictive text to change a pitch based on the likelihood of success, not just what's coming from your brain, but what, what the algorithm thinks the right words should be used in order to get a reporter interested. That is a huge leap. It is highly controversial because, again, we're trying to wed art and science. And I do believe in the art of my tradecraft, but I think that we're also lacking in science. So I think that voice skills, predictive text, things like GPT-3 and others, those are things that are going to come to the fore eventually. The question is, how do we sell it? How do we sell it without scaring the shit out of people? And how do we sell it in a way that's really, truly performative for our business and good for the world? Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. You you touched on it there. Look, the, the selling of it and getting broader and wider adoption is something that grows in time and often comes with previous examples of, of impact and performance. Is there a particular standout project or recent use case that you, you're proud of that demonstrates just how useful this platform can be? There's, there's a few. And of course, I probably can't and should not name names. And that's the other thing is I wouldn't say they're trying to hide it, but this is still like a secret weapon for a lot of brands. And, and they don't necessarily want the world to know that they're using technology 
to front run whether or not a reporter is going to be interested, even though I will say when it comes to reporters, reporters love this because they're getting um, fewer, more accurate pitches to their inbox than all the garbage that they get constantly day in, day out. But we had one beauty company, CPG Beauty Company, who they know their endemic media. They know who covers like their product, right? Or products. But when they want to go to CES and they want to have a tech play or a tech angle to their product, they have no idea who those reporters are and whether or not anyone's going to be interested. And we ran their pitch through Profit. We adjusted it. And we surfaced three or four reporters that they would not have found on their own necessarily or with any sort of confidence to be interested. They pitched them and they got great placements. Something um, similar happened with a large tech company that was doing a fundraise or a series F round uh, where we were able to surface a couple of reporters. And I'll give you an example. Let's say we showed them 10 reporters from Bloomberg who might be interested. And the, the platform actually forced ranked one through 10. And the number one reporter that was most interested is the number one reporter who expressed interest when we pitched them the story idea on the series F round. Um, so I thought that was fascinating because the, 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 the technology was able to parse through not just so many outlets, but also the reporters and the outlets at the newsrooms determining, is it going to be, I'm just making up names right now, Rachel, or is it going to be Roger, who's more interested in this pitch? And we're like, but Rachel, and we won. We got it. We nailed it. So those types of case studies are fascinating. They're phenomenal. The only thing I'll say, and I think everyone on your podcast, all your listeners will appreciate this, is tech is not 100%. You still have to use your human brain. And I use Waze as an example, right? You can't always trust Waze. It's going to take you places that you might to get. It's going to take you out of your way to save two minutes sometimes. You have to be smarter than the tech sometimes. You need to mind meld with it. So the user still has to look at this list of reporters that were surfacing. Not all of them are going to be spot on. But if we can find one or two that hadn't been on your radar before, that could have an impact moment in writing about your story idea that can then drive your business, then we've done our job. So that's what's so exciting about this platform. Final question for me, Aaron. Obviously, you sit at the top table, so you're looking at the business side, but you also the, the platform side. And, and part of that is, is getting people interested in the mission to join and be part of Profit. So when you sit down and you speak to candidates, particularly on the technology side, what is it that you tell them about what you're trying to do here and just how transformative this platform can be that will get them excited to, to, to go on this journey with you, particularly through the lens of people who are interested in utilizing AI data science? Great question. I literally, before this recording, got off a call with a prospect. And I said to them, I want you to help me help our customers see around corners that they couldn't see before. And when you look around that corner, I need you to help me scrape enough data to give them confidence that they're pitching the right reporter, the right story um, at the right time versus just throwing darts at a dartboard. It, it's like picking stocks. You just, you know, they have these these competitions between monkeys who are picking stocks and then like traders and the monkeys win half the time. So we're trying to remove some of that guesswork. And I said, the reason why you should join us, the reason why you should be interested in us is because this is the tip of a revolution inside of an industry that is so analog and is so human driven, which is fine but we need technology to backstop our gut and our instinct and be more performative. And that's why I need you to join us. That's a great way to finish the interview. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us about Profit. It's always exciting to hear about new use cases and applications for AI in an industry where you're tackling a problem. It sounds like a fun problem to tackle and clearly you guys are having some early wins. So we wish you, the team and everyone at Profit the best of luck in the years ahead. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldis Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.